At the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains is Silmar, California, the northernmost neighborhood in the city of Los Angeles. Few people who drive past this community of 90,000 are aware that it's home to something out of this world. Something that helps power communications and GPS satellites and makes it possible for humans to live on the International Space Station and explore the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and the solar system beyond. Welcome to the Special Discovery Education and Boeing Future U virtual site visit to Spectrolab. Hey everyone, I'm Ricardo Anaya. I'm a test engineer here at Spectrolab, and today I'm going to take you on a special behind the scenes tour to show you how we make high efficiency solar cells for space. You might be surprised to learn that Spectrolab is part of the Boeing company. Yes, the same Boeing company that makes commercial jets and military aircraft also makes satellites, rockets, capsules, and other technology to help us explore space. Spectrolab creates the solar cells that power those spacecraft and has been doing it right here in Silmar since 1956. This model next to me is of a satellite called SYNCOM. In the 1960s, it became the first communication satellite that was geosynchronous, meaning that its orbit matched the Earth's rotation. That breakthrough eventually led to GPS, the global positioning system that helps pinpoint where we are on Earth and the best way to get to where we want to go. Take the exit on the right. Satellites also bring us cable and network TV, the internet, mobile phones, more accurate weather forecasts, and so many other conveniences we take for granted today. Spectrolab solar cells have also helped us explore the solar system. They went to the moon on the Apollo 11 mission. They've gone to Mars, where they power a reconnaissance satellite and the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that are exploring the Martian surface right now. They've even been to Jupiter on the Juno mission that set a record for the furthest from the sun a solar-powered vehicle has ever traveled. Spectrolab is renowned for making solar cells like this one, which is the most efficient solar cell ever made. Sometimes called a photovoltaic cell, a solar cell is a device that converts the energy of sunlight into electricity. One solar cell provides only a small amount of power, but solar cells can be connected together to form solar arrays that generate much more power, enough to power the International Space Station. About 275,000 solar cells make up the arrays on the International Space Station. Those arrays produce about 120 kilowatts, or enough electricity to power more than 100 homes in the United States. That's the most power generated by any spacecraft in orbit. Today, we're going to learn a lot more about solar cells and how they're made. So let's get started. We're joined now by Andrew Palmer, an equipment engineering manager, who's going to tell us more about what happens in this part of Spectrolab. Yeah, so now we're in the MOVPE laboratory. Um, MOVPE is Metal Organic Vapor Phase Epitaxy, which is a fancy word that basically means we're taking gaseous materials and we're growing solar cells in our chemical reactors. So what we do is we have a chemical reactor and it's in many ways it's like an oven um, that you heat the wafers up to a very high temperature. We flow various gases and materials and we'll deposit and grow the crystalline structure and that's what makes a solar cell a solar cell. You say growing, are these alive? No, the cells aren't alive. Um, when you refer to growing, we're talking about crystal growth. So I like to explain it like if you're in a snowstorm and you're watching snow deposit on a roof, you'll see that snow grow layer by layer. And that's very similar to what happens inside our reactor. It's a pretty complex structure. There's about 80 layers in total, but it really comes down to three major layers of the three uh, junctions of solar cells that we grow. 80 layers sounds pretty thick. How thick are they actually? Well, our layers are extremely thin. They're so thin, some of them are in the nanometer and micrometer range, which is a millionth or a billionth of a meter. And for example, a uh, nanometer is how long your fingernails will grow in one second. So you can imagine that's a very, very thin structure. And why is that important for solar cells? Well, it's really important for efficiency. The triple junctions needs to capture all the different wavelengths of light. And the more light that we could capture and convert to electricity, the more efficient our cells can become. Can you tell me a little more about that process? How does it convert sunlight into electricity? So when the sunlight hits the solar cell, it adds a lot of energy and it'll activate the electrons and then make them jump from one barrier to the other. And since these layers act as kind of a one-way door, they have to travel all the way back through the circuit, powering your lights or heaters or whatever you're powering from it, your satellite equipment, to come back to the solar cell. And what makes Spectrolab solar cells so unique? So our solar cells are unique because they're designed specifically for space. 
Um, they have to be very light and very high efficiency. And that's one of the reasons we use the triple junction technology. I notice everybody in this area is wearing protective gear. Why is that? Yeah, well, the clean room garments are really important. What they do is our clothes and our hair and our skin actually sheds a lot of particles. And because our layers are so thin, one particle could cause a lot of damage to our efficiency and our solar cells. Um, so we wear the clean room garments, which we refer to as bunny suits because we kind of look like rabbits in them. Um, and that's a very important part to keep our process clean. Is there anything else you can tell us about this place? Yeah, what, what I find fascinating about this process and these reactors is that we're able to use this equipment to control the solar cells at the atomic level. And our devices even use some quantum effects, which uh, before I worked in this industry, I thought was theoretical, but it's actually real, it's here, and we could hold it in our hands. We're now outside the solar cell wafer processing room. I'm joined by Jonti Singh, a technician. Jonti, what happens here? Uh, in this area, we developing the, from the grown wafers to manufacture the solar cells. Yeah, we going through here a lot of different processes, almost 30 processes. So on, then we go for anti-reflection coating, the metal coatings, and going through few etching processes to remo remove the unneeded material from it and the grinding them to the lessen the weight of the solar cells and on the end, we heat them up to the temperature so all these materials bond together. Why is the solar cell called the wafer here? Actually, the wafer is the base to make the solar cell on it. Throughout all this 150 millimeter fab, we call it wafer because solar cell is not developed until we finish our last process. As soon as the last process is finished, the solar cell is complete, and then we send the next area. Do you make solar cells in different shapes and sizes? Yes, we do here, uh, because this all depends on the demand from the customer, what they're looking for. Still, there are another different features customer requesting, so we make it accordingly. After the solar cell leaves this area, is it now functioning? Can it produce power? Yes, it will because uh, it's, a fully, it's supposed to be fully functional. Uh, if you put it under the light, you can see it's working perfectly fine, but we need further test and to cut before we send to the panel area. Thanks, Shanti, for explaining what happens in the wafer processing room. Before we move on, you're going to take a quiz to see how much you've learned so far today. Hey, welcome back. I'm here with Rebecca Zell, a SpectroLab process engineer. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Where are we? We're in the kicking area, or CIC. It stands for cell, interconnect, and cover glass. What is a cell, interconnect, cover glass? Well, a cell is the bare cell that you just learned about in the first part of the tour. And then the interconnects are pieces of metal that go between the cells and kind of act like wires so current can pass from cell to cell. This robot right here is actually putting the interconnects on the cell. This robot does many tiny precise welds over and over again. So it's able to do it much faster and more accurately than a human could. So what happens after the interconnects get put onto cells? After the interconnects get put on, we bond the cover glass onto the top. The cover glass is a layer of glass that protects the cells from harmful radiation while still letting sunlight through. Is it always the same cover glass that's used? No, we don't always use the same cover glass. Depending on where the satellite will be and what conditions it will be in, we can use thicker or thinner cover glass and put different coatings on it so that different types of radiation are allowed through. Is the process finished after the cover glass is put in place? No, after the cover glass is on, the cells have to go through testing. The first test it goes through is FBIR, or forward virus infrared testing. Here we light up the cells so it's easier to see if the cells are cracked or there are any defects in the cover glass. Then it's put into a solar simulation where there's a light that acts like the sun. So it's the same spectrum and brightness as the cells would see in space. We test there for its electrical capabilities to make sure all the cells are producing enough electricity. And what happens after the cells pass all the testing? After the cells pass the test, they actually go through more environmental testing and are put on a panel, which you'll learn about in the next section. Great, thank you, Rebecca. With us now is Anal Diaz, a production operations specialist. Uh, and where are we right now? Right now we're in one of the bay areas. We have two, we have a low bay and a high bay. This high bay area was built higher for much bigger panels. 
And as you can see, we have different sizes. So depends on which, um, what kind of panel you're building, depends where you're at. I see there's some work going on behind us. What's going on here? Yes, um, one of our operators right now, she's finishing up one of the panels. Once she's finished with that, it'll get turned into quality control mm -hmm. and then into testing for environmental testing. Once they're done, it'll be ready for the wing. Why is a solar panel better than a single cell? Well, I mean, if you put it like the tug of war, you have one individual on one side and you have five individuals on the other side. Who's gonna get the more power? The one with the most people. It's the same with the cell. You have more power when you, when you attach more cells to a panel versus one or two cells. And how much power does one of these panels produce? Uh, the size of this panel can produce up to 2,000 watts, the equivalent to 200 LED light bulbs. I mean, imagine having that many light bulbs in your house at one time, that's a lot of power. And how long does it take to build one of these panels? Pretty much depends on the size. An example for this one, it will um, take about, well, give or take three to four months. On this tour, we've met several of my colleagues who have talked about what they do in their part of Spectrolab. Welcome to my area. I'm an environmental test engineer, and this is where we perform environmental testing. Environmental testing is where we try to simulate the environment in space here on Earth. The environment in space is very harsh. It can get very cold, it can get very hot, there's the vacuum of space, there's radiation, there are a lot of factors that can affect the product. So what we try to do here is replicate those factors so that we can catch defects before it gets launched. Because once it's in space, we can't go up there and repair it. Most people think that the temperature in space is very, very cold, and it is, but an object flying in space can get very hot if the sun is shining on it. It's similar to when you're out in the sun and you go under a shaded tree. Under the shaded tree, you get pretty cool, but once you go out in the sun, you can only be there for a few minutes before you start really feeling the heat. One way of replicating the environment in space is by using a thermal chamber, like the one behind me. This chamber can take temperatures from extreme hot to extreme cold very fast, and this is repeated over and over again for hundreds, sometimes thousands of cycles. In this area, we do other tests. One of the most important ones is the LAPS test. LAPS stands for Large Area Pulsed Solar Simulator. It's a giant flashlight that flashes onto our panels and simulates the sun. By doing so, we can see what the performance of the panel will be before we launch it. It can take many years for the qualification of a new product to be introduced. The reason for this is because we need to see how the effect of thermal cycling affects a product over an extended period of time. After all, we expect our satellites to be in space for many years. One example of something that's been up in space for a long time is the International Space Station. It's been in orbit for over 20 years. The original panels have started to degrade, so we're just now replacing them. We're at the final stop of our Spectrolab tour. Let's meet Hardy Aguirre, a solar array process engineer. Hey Hardy. Hey Ricardo. Why is this the final stop? So this is the last stop because after panel assembly, after environmental testing, now it's time to put our panels together into a solar array. A solar array, as this one, is a combination of panels put together that is then gonna be deployed out in outer space. It also looks really heavy. How much does it weigh? So each panel on this solar array weighs about 80 pounds. This solar array is comprised of three panels, so it's about 240 pounds. That's actually not as heavy as I would have thought. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, actually we wanna make sure that we keep the, the weight down of our solar arrays because it requires less rocket fuel and rocket fuel is really expensive. So we wanna make sure that we keep these solar arrays very light. How long does it take to assemble this solar array? A solar array can take anywhere from three to six weeks and that depends on how many panels you're gonna use. So now that you've built a solar array, where does it go next? So next, we're gonna fold the array, send it out to acoustic testing, and acoustic testing is important because it mimics the vibration of a rocket launch. And so we wanna know that our solar array will withstand the vibration of a rocket launch. On today's tour, we've shown students how we go from a single solar cell to a full array. Is it unusual for one company to do all that? I think it's unusual and very unique that Spectrolab has the capability of experiencing the manufacturing of a solar cell all the way to a solar wing. And what kind of people need to work here to make that possible? We need people of all skills and all educations here. And most importantly, wanting to do the work. And what's it like to work on something that you know will soon be in space? I think it's awesome. Uh, it's something that I dreamed of as a, as a little kid. I've always, always interested in working on uh, space 
hardware and here I am working on space hardware, eventually this solar array behind us will be in space and that's a great feeling. Our site visit to Spectrolab is now complete, but your part isn't finished yet. Get ready for a hands-on activity to further extend your learning today. On behalf of Discovery Education and Boeing Future U, we hope you have learned a lot today and are feeling inspired.